Welcome to the Fulfillment Project Podcast. I'm your host, Simply Sarah, and I'm so glad that we've connected here today. I've created a series called Life Chats. This is a four-part series of each of my amazing guests as I take you on a journey through their awakening process. My aim and goal for this show is to give you, the seeker, a container to explore your own growth as you awaken and step into more alignment, more joy, and more fulfillment every single day. Rachel Benton, welcome to the Fulfillment Project and your life chat series. I'm so excited to have you here today. And I'm so excited to be here. I love, love, love what you're doing. So, so excited to be part of it. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun unpacking stories of, you know, inspired, uh, inspiring women who are in my life like yourself and sharing the growth and sharing the awakening uh, because I feel we need to have more of these open conversations to help each other through. I so agree. And it's, it's by talking about it, right? It's about sharing and that's what I'm all about. So I'm so excited to dive into today. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so I met you about a year ago. Is that correct? Oh, no. Two. No, I was two years. Yes. Two years, two ago. years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. I feel like the two years have just like flown by. I agree, yeah. Yeah. I actually was uh, reading something the other day on social media about how since, you know, March, 2020, the last two years have just been a blur and a lot of people have lost uh, a sense of a timeline uh, mm -hmm. because of uh, the state of the world and everything that was happening in the end of end lockdown out of lockdown. I agree with that. And it's funny that you say that because I remember like in 2020, March happened and then we got into September and I feel like we went from March to September in no time. And yeah, so yeah, I can still see that. But I do believe there's been so much power in the last two years of giving, giving us all space to, to think and to reevaluate. And I have heard and seen so many people wake up uh, because of the state of the world and, and what we were put into. And I know you were one of those people. I've had huge awakenings through it. And I'm excited to unpack this journey of what an awakening looks like. And I love that I'm doing this with, you know, so many different women because different things come out of each awakening and there's always a new level and a new level. And everybody goes through it differently, right? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, your story is really around recognizing self-abandonment, self-rejection, getting to listen to yourself and open up that intuition, which I know mm -hmm. breeds such deep uh, trust and, and groundedness within us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so much um, just connection and love. Um, and we're yes, we're going to unpack all that. But um, yeah, yes, yes. And so let's let's go back. Let, let's start at the beginning, um, you know, with you recognizing self abandonment and, and self rejection. Where did that begin for you now looking back and being able to put the pieces together? Um, to recognize it, that didn't start till last year. Um, but for the longest time, for, well, since, since I was so young, um, I was a child of abandonment and I was such a victim to it. I played that victim card throughout my entire childhood of, uh, being that my, my father didn't want me. I was abandoned. I was rejected every, every sense of the word. And um, a lot of emotions were packed in with that. But it's, it's, it's quite interesting now, now after doing so much work on myself and looking back and, and being in that, being in those shoes and being that person, there's a lot of forgiveness that I had to do. But to go back and to look at it and to see how I was, my purpose back then was just to look for acceptance and love from everybody. That was my end goal. That was the bottom line. And it didn't matter what I had to do. I did it without even thinking about what I wanted. It was just, I want this person to like me. This is what they want me to do. This is what I'm going to do. And a lot of shame came from that, right? A lot of guilt now looking at it um, from a different perspective, from a completely different person. It's pretty amazing to see, um, yeah, that, that victim card, I'm going to use it again because it's so powerful, that victim card that I was using all the time without realizing it. And um, I use this word a lot too, is I was a chameleon. 
right? I was a chameleon as a child, um, no emotions. I just became, I became what other people wanted me to be all the time. And I completely shut down my emotions and I didn't feel, I felt uh, there was so much, uh, when I started unpacking it, there was so much alone, feeling alone, so alone and so much pain that I completely shut that down and just, it was easier to become what others wanted me to be. But, and it was easier to live in my head, completely immersed in another world of imagination than it was to face what I was going through on a day-to-day basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're not awake to that, there is uh, self-sabotaging, there is putting yourself in situations that create pain, that create struggle, and you end up in these cycles, which is part of the awakening process is breaking, breaking those patterns and breaking those cycles. Yeah, and, and um, the energy, the energy that I was projecting back then attracted the people that just wanted, um, without them realizing it, that they just wanted somebody they can control. And I was that lucky person, but so grateful today to be able to recognize these things and so grateful today to be able to, uh, to say a big thank you because there's so much growth that came from this so much awakening that came from this and yeah it's uh it's 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 pretty amazing yeah yeah and, and in emma suviat's series we were talking about trauma bonds mm. and they don't just happen in intimate relationships they happen with um, coach client relationship friend relationships who we attract if we're not doing the work our ego will seek out its match to give us that validation. I think this is such a beautiful topic uh, for women. And I mean, I can really only speak on behalf of women because it's who I am. It's mostly who I surround myself with. It's mostly who I coach. And I see these patterns of such a a need, a need to fit in, a need to be validated, a need to be liked, a need to uh, feel like we're good enough, to, uh, you know, all those deep, deep wounds. And even as a child, you know, wanting to fit in with circles of friends, I think that's natural for anyone. And then if you layer on top of that, any wounds that have happened at a younger age, it just will compound this effect of seeking so much validation outside of ourselves that we don't even know who we are. Mm-hmm. We've lost ourselves. We can't even hear that intuition, which is a conversation we want to get into as the episodes unroll here. Yeah. But to start this perpetuation, you know, we don't have to go into detail if you don't want to, but what happened more specifically as a child that really started this momentum that you can look back now and recognize? Um, I had a, an absent father. And um, when I was very young, my parents were still together. He wasn't around. He was a, um, a truck driver. And so he would leave on Sunday afternoons and most time wouldn't come back till Friday night, spend the weekend at the garage working on his trucks. We barely saw him. So he, his presence was barely there. And so the relationship was in there. And um, my parents separated when I was very young as well. And um, his presence was just not there. He He wouldn't show up to our visits and um, decided that I, something I know now today, but decided that it was better for us in his mind if he left us alone than if he was actually part of our lives. Um, In his mind today, um, knowing this, um, in his mind, it was easier for us to not have to go through the back and forth and um, having his role in our lives for him, he thought he was doing the best thing for us. But as a child, we don't understand that. I didn't understand that. What I understood as a child was that my father didn't want me and my father didn't love me. And I was not good enough for him to make um, time for his child. And so that that is what spiraled into um, a lifelong, this has been a lifelong Uh, journey for me really it took me so long to understand and to accept but um, that's where it started and um, yeah I was a very very sensitive child and I cried a lot as a child and I never understood why I used to shame myself because 
that was my way of processing was to cry and I cried and I cried and I'd somebody would say something just the wrong way and I would cry and knowing today that it all stemmed back from being very careful what other people would say to me because if it if I took it wrong I was being abandoned over and over and over and so I live this abandonment over and over with my friends with my family with anybody that came into my life and and then yeah and then I started doing it to myself yeah yeah these internal wounds uh I like to look at it uh you know you you cut your hand and you you can physically see that there's hurt well there needs to be repair there needs to be care there needs to be you know sometimes some intervention in order to help that healing and and our internal pain is exactly the same and what you have been in the process of doing is really breaking generational trauma Mm -hmm. you know for you know I I know most people in this world mean well, and your dad felt like he was meaning well. He was making the best decision possible. But when there is most likely trauma coming from his end as well, not having, you know, communication skills, growth skills that are just not taught in our everyday world, there will be a, uh, you know, a push away, not knowing how to deal with that or not wanting to open up his own wounds in order to to step up for the family. And it perpetuates, it perpetuates again and again. It, it really does. And the fact too, that awareness wasn't a thing back then. Awareness, like people didn't work on them, themselves back then. And still today, if I look back at, like, if I look at my father, I, it's not something that would even be in his vocabulary. And so, um, yeah. And so, and so looking back and thinking about how we've evolved so much as a community, as a collective, as a society, um, but it's a different generation and um, male, female could also have something to do with it as well. But um, yeah, it, but for me, like you were saying, breaking generational trauma is huge in this situation. And uh, to be able to sit back, to be able to actually voice it and talk to you about it right now just proves how far I've come. But to be able to look back and appreciate my dad and to be grateful for him and his role in my life is absolutely huge and to be able to sit here and say I truly honestly love him with every cell of my being in his own way because of the person he is but also because of the person I became because I am the person I am today because of him hands down oh I just got chills Mm -hmm. um being on the other side of anything allows us to see that beautiful connection of dots. And when you have these revelations or awakening or awareness, of course you wouldn't want to take it back because uh, as, as painful of the, as the awareness can be in order to do the growth work on the other side of it creates more joy, more, more fulfillment, more uh, freedom, you know, freedom mm-hmm. from ourselves, freedom from our mind, freedom from our emotions. And if we don't learn these skills, then we stay trapped into our patterns. Absolutely. Oh, yes. I got chills. Just Yes. Uh, do you believe, uh, you know, I've heard this here and there. Do you believe that we choose our parents? I do. Before even coming into this world? I do. I really, really honestly do. I truly believe that. And if I look at both of mine, uh, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. their both of their roles because I have a very strong mother and I had an absent father. And I am, um, the things that I've learned from both of them really are shaping the person that I am become every single day. But it's really, if, if I, if I look back and I truly also believe that our purpose here on earth is to come home to ourselves. That is why we're here. We are here to pick up the pieces as we go along. We're putting fragments back of our souls, back into our souls as we're moving forward. And every fragment that we're putting back, every piece that we're putting back of ourselves within ourselves, we are becoming more and more um, truthful. We're our authentic self, our truth. And this, I truly believe that this is why we're here to do that. And looking at my parents and their roles in my lives, that is exactly what they've done. 
that is exactly what they've done. They have um, helped me find the pieces that were missing so that I can start putting them back. So I can rebuild my soul as a whole so I can find love, I can find connection, I can find truth within myself. And yes, that's a big, big, big yes. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I'm inside. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and that's why I see there is this total new paradigm that so many of us are living under now, where we don't want to keep perpetuating uh, fear cycles, where we don't want to keep perpetuating the traumas that are being passed down from generation to generation and stepping up and, and having that awareness of, okay, like, how, how, how am I creating the life that is continuing to unfold for me out of programming, out of what we, you know, um, uh, saw modeled, out of, you know, what society shows us to be as an ideal life. And it's like stopping the brakes on all of that and going, er, <laughs> wait a second, what do I want to create here? And then, you know, what am I perpetuating that is not leading me in that direction? I agree. And it took me so long, so long to get to, 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 to have that awareness. And you and I've had this conversation before too, but to have even a glimpse of an awareness that I was creating Mm. my reality over and over and over. And still today, like there's patterns that come up and I'm like, I'm doing this. What am I doing? What am I not doing? Why am I creating this? But I spent, it's not all, I I think it was in my late twenties that I had my first this can't be it. Like this can't be it. Life can't be this. And if this is it, I'm missing something. Like, why am I here? And it's when I started asking those questions that my awareness was growing and I started realizing then people being brought into your path, um, books that you read. I started attending conferences that it really broke me open to oh, wow, like I am creating this. And like like the victim card that I was talking about earlier, that card was huge. Like if somebody would reproach something to me, that's the card I was used, right? Like it was, this, this was my card. And to start realizing that I had built my life on that card, that was painful mm-hmm. because that's not the person that I wanted to be. That's not the person that I am. Right. And so to be able to recognize this, but it's by opening up my awareness and it's by realizing that there is so much more to life than that little life of every day, um, not realizing what, why well, I, I didn't feel back then. I could completely shut down my emotions. So not feeling, and it was just like a, I, I felt like a robot, right? It was an everyday cycle. We did this, we did this, we did this, we came home, we did this. And yeah, and it's, it's when I started opening up that awareness that things really started shifting for me and fast. Yeah, it's that personal responsibility, which can be freeing, but also there, there's a heavy load to carry to open, to turn that lens on ourselves and yeah. to recognize, oh, <laughs> I can't blame it on everybody else. <laughs> I can't say this is your fault and the government's fault, <laughs> this yeah. person's fault. Um, but, uh, and that's a protective mechanism, right? Like that victim card is a total protective mechanism. It is our ego saying, uh-uh, I, I'm not willing to do the work. I'm not willing to look at myself and change because um, I'm not the problem. Exactly. Absolutely. And protection. If I look back, that's exactly how I was living. Fear ruled my life. Protection. That victim card. Protection. Me not feeling. Protection. Like everything. I had layers and layers and layers of protection that I needed to really start removing to be able to really come to my own truth, to to what was actually happening on my in, internal within me. Mm-hmm. Let's let's unpack what you just said there a little bit more. And so what was that process or do you remember the moment where you're just like, oh, like I'm the problem? Was that last summer when you had that big aware, uh, awakening or was it a slow progression of moments? It was a slow progression of moments um, from a very long time, like probably a decade of slow progression um, because a part of you doesn't want to realize it doesn't want to come to terms that you're creating this for yourself. And so for me, there was a, Oh, I'm doing this. 
oh, but I'm going to protect. And then, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little brave. So then I would open up a little more. Oh, I'm going to protect. And so I feel like 10 years of my life was a little bit and then retracting and then a little expansion and then retraction. And so this is how I went for a very, very long time. And, and to be honest, it's not, it's the last couple of years and that I really was like, no more. I'm done living in this fear. I'm done letting all of this, my ego, protect me, stopping me, resisting every step of the way. Cause that's exactly what was happening. I would take a few steps, I'd resist and I'd contract and I'd hide and I'd live in fear. No more, I didn't want that anymore. And so I was able to start really, I was tired. I was tired of living like this. I had enough and I wanted more. And I wanted more out of life. And I kept saying to myself, if I'm creating my world, if I'm creating my life, I want to do it my, on my own terms, not little step by little step, you know, dabbling. We all dabble a little, you get your foot wet, you put it back. And it was, I had enough. And so it was really, it took a long time, but it's in the last couple of years that I, I like no more. Let's take the barriers off. Let's sit here raw and vulnerable and um, take what comes. And, and kind of roll with it. And that's I, scary. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying it. And I'm like, wow, I did that. But it's scary. It's uncomfortable. But leaning into that discomfort was what got me through it. I've, I've seen that happen with a lot of women in my case as well, where you spend a decade going to the conferences, reading the books, doing some work, learning a bunch of tools. And it's almost like you're fumbling around with all this stuff and it makes sense and you see progress, but there's a moment where you have to give up the struggle where you're, mm -hmm. where you're like, I don't, I don't want to struggle anymore. Like, I really want to commit to this work. I don't want to just read a book and put it on the shelf and not implement any of the things. And there's this moment of clicking and there's value in the decade of work that has progressed because everything just like click, 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 click. And it's like a whole <laughs> puzzle comes together. You're like, oh, <laughs> I see. I get yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I love, love, love everything that you said. Cause that's exactly, that was exactly me. Right. I went to the conferences. I read the books. I was doing the things I had affirmations all over my house. <laughs> right. And, but I was still so much living in fear and so much being protected that uh, yeah, I couldn't move forward. And yeah, when I made the decision and I made, I, I made a commitment and that was the big thing. I made a commitment that I was going to stand in my vulnerability, stand in my rawness, stand in my truth and whatever happened, happened. And I wanted to experience that. Mm -hmm. Ooh, vulnerability. I love that word. Mm. Uh, you know, the work of Brene Brown is all around vulnerability, all around shame mm -hmm. and a lot of the times we think vulnerability is weakness until Absolutely. we've gotten to the point to realize it's strength. Um, I kind of look at vulnerability like um, that movie with Eminem, Eight Mile, where mm -hmm. he does the rap battle and he just like gives away everything that he is. And when you can show up authentically, whether you're doing okay or not, and you're, you just, you're like, I'm in it, I'm in it, but I'm yeah. here. Yeah. We don't, no one has anything to come at you. And I think that's the fear of vulnerability of if I let people see this side of myself or know this side of myself, then I won't be liked. I won't be accepted. I won't be loved. And it's until you get to that point of accepting yourself first that you don't even care who accepts you because you've found yourself. Exactly. And, and like you, vulnerability to me was weakness. Mm -hmm. But what was for me, what was the big aha moment is if I was vulnerable I'd go into a vulnerability, uh, vulnerability hangover, mm. right? And then I'd want to hide. And I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I was raw. I can't believe I was vulnerable. But if you came at me and you showed me your vulnerability, I used to think you were so strong, so courageous. And then at one point I was like, well, what's the difference? Why is she, you, courageous for being vulnerable, but yet I'm weak when I do it? And that for me was like a mind blown, like, Okay, Rach, we need to um, redefine the definition of vulnerability for me. And so when I was able to start doing that, and I started realizing too, when I, when I started showing up vulnerable with my clients and with 
everybody that uh, follows me or whatnot, the um, response was so much bigger than when I was trying to be perfect and make it look like as if everything was okay when it wasn't. And people really started relating. And that's when I realized that, wow, like talking about it, sharing the struggles really help somebody else realize that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. I find our own vulnerability gives permission to others. Mm. Uh, instead of, you know, trying to hold all, hold all the pieces together. And you said earlier, it's, it's exhausting. It's like you're trying to hold all these pieces together and this image of yourself and like, am I liked here? And there's yeah. just such a leakage of precious energy. And no wonder we get sick. You know, mm -hmm. you and I have both struggled with some internal health issues, yeah. you know, en energy draining, like not feeling like ourselves, having this disconnection, living in our heads. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just such a lack of resonance with our true internal being that it's painful. Like that's the pain. It's because you're not in resonance with, resonance with who you really are. Yeah. And we try to look outside of ourselves and do all the things, but until we can put those brakes on. Yeah. A lot of your work with clients is around uh, inner child, mm -hmm. inner child healing, and so much growth comes from that and going back. So I'd love for you to explain what is inner child healing. So inner child healing is really um, going back to that beautiful little girl within and to spend some time with her to understand how she's feeling because we don't realize that our inner child most of the time is the one steering the ship. She is the one in control, and but she's also the one that hangs on to all of the traumas, all of the hurts, all of the pains, the betrayals, the judgments, you name it, she hangs on to all of this. And when we don't actually take the time to spend some time with her, to talk to her, to, um, listen to what she has to say, that's how we live. We let her lead. But when we, when we pause, we take a breath, we tune in, we, we connect with this beautiful, part, this beautiful part of yourself, you get to spend time rediscovering that child within you so that you can free her free her from all that pain and suffering and, and give her permission to be a child, give her permission to have fun. And a lot of the times, and you and I have had that this, con this, con this conversation about joy and fun in our lives. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times uh, we can't have fun. We don't know what that means is because our inner child doesn't know how to have fun because she is in so much pain. And so when you can take the time, free her, listen, and start giving yourself what it is that you needed back then, you start healing. And that's huge healing work right there. And you start um, understanding yourself a little more and you start accepting where you're at, where you came from, where you're at and where you're going. And that in itself is huge for your healing, right? Yeah, that's really how I envision an awakening. I see a lot of people are 35, 40 years old, but their mental and emotional state is at the level of a five-year-old, seven-year-old, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you were saying there. And so you repeat the same patterns and you have the same conversations and you repeat the same emotional cycles. And that awakening is stopping, going back and, and healing the 35, 40 plus years of all of the automatic programming that just played out your life. Yeah. There's so much power in so many different tools, whether it's, you know, like hypnosis or meditation, um, but this conscious work of, of recognizing, like, what is my inner child saying? How are they feeling? And doing that self-soothing and that self-healing. Yeah. And a lot of the times it's becoming the parent that you didn't have or, or the, the uh, emotions that did not come out of that parent. Yeah, to, to give yourself that because you can't ask it of anybody else. It's what can we give ourselves to move forward? Yeah, it's to fill those needs, mm -hmm. the needs that we needed back then, the needs that we need today, because a lot of us don't even look at that today. Mm -hmm. What am I needing right now from myself, from other people? 
and to realize that a lot of it comes from what you lacked as a child is what you are desperately needing today as an adult because that child still dictates. So if, if you had um, a, a bad relationship with a parent, a lot of the time when you get into a relationship yourself, you're getting into a relationship with your seven-year-old self. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done for you to get back to this understanding of where you are today. And um, it's pretty beautiful. It's, it's amazing work. It's probably one of my favorite um, modalities, tools that I use. Um, and to build that relationship with my own inner child was just absolutely amazing for me. And I always tell this to my client. I, I meet my inner child on a park bench somewhere. And we sit there and we chat and um, I always grab her by the hand at the end. And we're like, we're in this together. You're not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. We're in this together. And so let's do this together. And if you're scared, you let me know. And if I'm scared, I'll let you know. And we, you know, grab each other's hands and we just let's move forward in this life together. Yeah. Um, what are some other things that you do with your inner child? Cause this helps people really see, like, yes, we need to do inner child healing, but what does that look like? And I know uh, some of my stuff was going out in the rain and I was jumping in puddles. Like my, I took my younger self and we jumped in puddles and just to, like move the body and have joy and be spontaneous. And as simple as that sounds, the, uh, the joy that comes from that is just so elating. Yes. And I love that you say that too, jumping into puddles, because I know I, this is, I get pulled when it's raining outside and it's nice, like a nice summer day, I get pulled to go. And for the longest time, I would stop myself and be like, oh, that's just silly. Don't do that. Right? Just, just silly, Why right? Do you do that? <laughs> exactly. But your inner child, like if you're going to the dentist and you hate going to the dentist, when you're done, go do something, go get ice cream, go um, run in the park, go do something that your inner child would be so excited to do. And it's just to, oh, it's just to give yourself permission, give yourself permission. I have clients that have such a hard time. I'm thinking of dancing because I'm such a dancer. I love to move and I'm always moving it, but it took me a long time to start moving intuitively. And I have clients that won't do it. We have group coaching sometimes. And I, I end my group coaching with songs. This is a thing. This is my thing. We finish with songs and we're all moving and we're like, yeah, this is good. And then you have some clients that are like, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. And then every time I see them, it's like your inner child, your inner child is stuck. Let's work on that. Right. Because your inner child wants to move. Think about a happy five-year-old, what they're doing. And it's funny because I have a three-year-old niece right now and I am observing her like nobody's business because she just says whatever she wants to say. She does. She's free. She's jumping in the puddles. She's running in the woods. She's doing everything that I want to do as an adult. And so I watch her and I'm like, oh, I'm not ready to do that. There's definitely something that I need to, to work on. But it's just to notice what a five-year-old would do. And where do you feel the resistance? What are they doing that are, is maybe triggering you because you're like, huh, I'd love to do that. Or I never got a chance to do that. And it's to go and meet with your inner child and let her do that in your mind. You don't actually physically have to do it right away. But seeing her in your mind through meditation, just closing your eyes and seeing that beautiful inner child. Like right now I'm closing my eyes and I can see my inner child running freely in a park after bubbles, right? Um, I'm seeing it. That's my first step. I want to be able to see it, to be able to embody it after and to do that, to get outside and run freely in the park. Yeah. And um, a lot of the times that's where it starts in your mind, seeing it and then embodying it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting how we we get so serious about life. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are a lot of things to be serious about, but we lose that childlike wonder. We lose that spark for joy, that pull to have fun. I used to be called no fun zone. All the, like, yeah. cause Joe's the first, uh, first uh, man I've ever dated with children and he's a big kid. And so during the summer, he'd love to get uh, Nerf guns or water guns. He's like, let's go outside and have like a water fight with the kids. And I have so much resistance. And I'd be like, no, like there's better things to do. Why would I do that? Like, that's just silly. Um, and then having that conscious awareness and looking and 
you know, I can see that my dad was a big kid and loved to play. And my mom would always make comments like, oh, your dad's just out playing or, oh, you know, your dad's gone to ride dirt bikes today and, you know, he's not helping around the house. And just like all these like little comments of where it wasn't okay to have fun or it wasn't okay to play. And like love my mother to death. And I know she wasn't doing, saying anything that was meaning to program anything within me, but that's just what happens. And so like, you know, it's good to look back and like, where did I stop having fun? And why do I not give myself permission to have fun? Yeah. And it's been pretty, for me as being um, the outsider, it's been pretty amazing to see you stepping into that fun, stepping into being able to let loose and, um, go sliding down the hill or, you know, and doing the Nerf gun fights or whatever, but it's, it's been pretty amazing to see you shift that and give yourself permission to have fun. Yeah. Like you said, like it, it's work. And, and sometimes you have to like consciously do it and pull yourself to do it, even when it feels icky, because you yeah. have to change, like you literally, re- you have to rewire the nervous system. You have to rewire the brain to rewire yeah. the emotional state. And it's that repetition again and again. Yeah, and and that amazing. whole process has changed my values in life. Like business, it has to be fun. Like if I'm creating this, like I'm not going to create something that is like stressful and frustrating and energy draining. That's just silly to think about it. You know, we talked about yeah. this conscious, this concept of conscious creation, and that's exactly what that is. Yeah. And to, to be able to bring that fun into your business and your work and your relationships. And it, it, it's so amazing how, when you start, it just touches everything else in your life. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. This was a beautiful opening. Uh, When we come back for part two, I want to go in with ways that you've seen yourself uh, abandon yourself over the years. I know there's been a lot in business as well. So my ladies in business, like this will be a great conversation for you. And then opening up the topic around intuition, what what that is, you know, how you can recognize your intuition and, and learning to be guided from such a a grounded uh, place within us that just feels so good. So thank you, Rachel. We'll see you back for part two. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this episode today. My website, simplysara.com is a great place for me to continue to support you on your journey to alignment, joy, and fulfillment. There you will find upcoming retreats that I am hosting, resources, books, and many other helpful tools to help you on your travels through this thing called life.